Hello guys and welcome to all those training to become Super Saiyans. This is Revolution. So on this video, what I'm going to be explaining to you is the Dragon Ball Omniverse. Now, since Dragon Ball Z, the whole Dragon Ball verse, if you can call it that, or you could call it the Toriyama verse, has grown significantly. Now, I did release a video not too long ago entitled Why the Dragon Ball Superverse is Bigger Than You Think. I'll link that at the end of this video so you can check it out. Now, this video will contain some information from that video, but the purpose of this video as a whole is to explain how the verse works systematically and accompany it with an explanation of how the dimensional metaphysics come into play. I'll also drop a few of the feet involved concerning dimensional tiering along the way as I know that's a thing the fans like to debate. So this video is based upon things we've seen in the manga of Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z and the anime of Dragon Ball Super along with information from accompanying official guidebooks such as the Daisenshu and the Super Exciting Guides. Dragon Ball Super however isn't at its completion so there are a lot of ambiguous things still to be settled within the anime itself. So this video is product of its time. There are still some avenues left unanswered in the Dragon Ball Super anime. So when it comes to those things, I will literally tell you we don't have a full explanation of this yet. I would never lie to you guys. I would never want to misinform you. But the aim here is to paint you the most comprehensive picture of the Dragon Ball verse or Toriyama verse as I possibly can. So to paint that picture to its richest and to paint that picture, I believe the best place to start is our own planet, planet Earth. So Earth is, well, Earth, what more can you say about it? According to Weiss, it's called planet 4032, green 877. So this Earth is supposed to resemble our own. However, there are quite a few differences. On this planet Earth, also known as the Dragon World, there are flying vehicles, capsules that can shrink inanimate objects down to pocket size, robots, and lots of science fiction staples that, that you would affiliate with a futuristic world. However, this planet Earth also inhabits dinosaurs and is politically led by a monarch anthropomorphic dog who is named King Furry. It is completely wacky and gives you an insight into Toriyama's mind. But the wackiness doesn't stop there. The guardian of the earth formerly was Kami and now is Dende, both of whom are Namekians. That position is basically being the god of earth. Now earth has been obliterated by Kid Buu and even Frieza. Other interesting things to know are Fortune Teller's palace which resides on earth has a transit point to the check-in station of King Yemas in Otherworld, which acts as a portal so that souls can cross to the other world or vice versa. Talking of the God of Earth, Dende, on Dende's lookout, there is the Room of Spirit and Time. The Room of Spirit and Time is also known as the Hyperbolic Time Chamber and it represents a separate dimension from that of now, the normal means of entering and exiting this pocket dimension are through the wooden door. But this is Dragon Ball. In the Boo saga, when Super Boo and Gotenks and Piccolo were trapped in there, Super Boo ripped a hole in the dimensional wall, and then Super Saiyan 3 Gotenks did the same thing a few moments later. However, it was a small hole, but it doesn't stop there. In Dragon Ball Super, it's very fresh in our memories, but Super Saiyan Blue Vegeta has obliterated this dimension twice simply by powering up. And now for some dimensional cataphysics. On Earth, there exists Penguin Village, which happens to inhabit living mountains. Now, Penguin Village is actually the home to Aral. Now, Aral has appeared in the Dragon Ball series consistently. She appeared in Dragon Ball to help Goku with General Blue, and she has lately even appeared in Dragon Ball Super. Goku instant transmissioned to Penguin Village after the God of Destruction tournament when suffering from key disease. Now, the reason this is cataphysical is because it shouldn't be possible. Planet Earth in Aurora's world is different to that of the Dragon Ball world. In the Dragon Ball world, we don't have continents such as North America, South America, Europe. In Aurora's world, they exist. In Dragon Ball Super, we even see Dr. Slump attend an awards ceremony in the Dragon Ball world. 
So this suggests there's a connection between those two Earths. There appears to be a portal between both dimensions. That seems to be accessible from Penguin Village. So as you can see, there are portals to different dimensions, even on Earth, the Dragon World. Now, Earth belongs to, obviously, the solar system. Cell did threaten that he could blow up the solar system with his power in the Cell games. And obviously, our solar system is in the Milky Way galaxy. Now, for anybody out there that's still under the impression that the Dragon Ball verse only has four galaxies, you are entirely wrong. What the four galaxies represent and the Cardinal Kai's watching over these galaxies are actually the rulers of a quadrant of the universe worth of galaxies. So latest astrological studies have found that there are one to two trillion galaxies in our universe. Now, if you divide that by four, you will get the amount of galaxies in their particular quadrant. So on estimate, King Kai is watching over an estimated 250 billion galaxies. Now, when you consider that there are estimated around 200 billion or more stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way alone, the size of a galaxy is enormous. Take that size and then times it by 1 trillion to 2 trillion. That makes a universe. Now, in terms of galaxy feats in Dragon Ball, Obviously in Dragon Ball Super they have far surpassed that, but in Dragon Ball Z, Boo was stated to be destroying galaxies at a rapid rate. Not one-shotting galaxies, but he was getting through them pretty thoroughly. At a rate even the Kais feared would destroy the universe in a short amount of time. So even though this is a little objective, in Dragon Ball Z what is suggested to us is that in the Saiyan Saga, the characters are around moon to small planet level, with Vegeta possibly being planet level. In the Freezer saga, <laughs> Freezer, in his first form, destroys a large planet, and in final form, you could say he's possibly star level, and obviously Super Saiyan Goku would be too. When we get to the Android saga, I'm talking about the stronger characters here, like the androids and the Super Saiyans, not particularly people like Krillin or Tien, but the stronger characters. They are approaching solar system level, but then when we get to the Cell games, Cell makes the claim that he could destroy the entire solar system, which means that Super Saiyan 2 Gohan theoretically should be able to too. Then we get to the Buu saga, and everybody able to compete with Kid Buu should be at least low galaxy level, but when you take into consideration that characters like Buuhan, Vegito, even Buu Tanks are way above Kid Buu, then you have to think that they could potentially be multi-galaxy level. So now we've wrapped up the galactic scale, we're going to move on to Universal. Now Universe 7, where all our heroes reside, is not exactly like our universe. It is in part, but actually it's a lot bigger. So in the Daizenshu, this is the model of Universe 7. You could argue here that it's comprised of four to five different structures. So obviously we have the universe, which is the lower half, that consists of all the stars, planets, solar systems, galaxies that we've just talked about. But then the top half is the cosmos, which basically contains other world, otherwise known as heaven. It also has a planet that holds the Grand Kai, who is basically in charge of all the Cardinal Kais. Then it consists of Snake Way, as well as all the planets for the Cardinal Kais. King Yemma's Palace, which serves as a check-in station for all those departed from the mortal universe. And as you can see, right in the middle lies hell. Now, hell, as we knew it before, was just all one big space. But in the ROF saga, Frieza mentioned that he is fed up of being an Earth's hell, which suggests to us that hell is comprised of different planetary Sections. If you die on a planet, you go to that version of hell, which is what Freezer did. He went to Earth's hell. Then right at the bottom of that model, we have what looks like a pinwheel. That is the Makaioshin realm. Now, Toriyama has mentioned Makaioshin in an interview, but we've not seen anything of them in the series. I hope we do eventually, but that remains to be seen, really. But that is the Makaioshin realm. It is the portal to the demon realm. And then there's the extra space created by the radius of the Supreme World of the Kais, which is the world that holds the Supreme Kai. The Supreme Kai's planet 
orbits around this construct that you can see in front of us and arguably you could say it's the size of three times of our very own universe. One unknown entity about all this is where exactly Beerus's planet is. I did make a theory video about that, it's called Beerus's Planet Location Theory, where I theorise that it is at the top of this construct, the polar opposite to the Mikaiushin realm. I used a few travelling feats to kind of get an implication of where it was. Check that out. Universe 7 also shares the Super Dragon Balls with Universe 6. It appears to have a at least nigh omniscient to omniscient being in Zuno and the Milky Way galaxy itself has a galactic patrol where the other galaxies do remains to be seen. Now the most famous universal feat that was seen in Dragon Ball Super was obviously Beerus vs Super Saiyan God Goku when they clashed fists three times. Whis, the Elder Kai and the narrator all said the universe was in peril until Goku found a technique that allowed him to nullify the shock waves of the third blow. So Universe 7, a construct that is three times the size of our very own universe, was about to go boom had Goku not conjured up this technique. So Universe 7 has a twin universe. We find this out in Dragon Ball Super episode 28 when Beerus's twin brother and fellow Hakaiyashin Shampa arrives on Beerus's planet. We learn that Universe 6 and 7 are twin universes and they are practically the same. Obviously the differences reside in the fact that certain things play out a different way. For example, the Saiyans in Universe 7 were warmongering, lost their original planet, Planet Sadal, and then moved to Planet Vegeta, which was ultimately destroyed by Frieza. Whereas the Saiyans in Universe 6 seem like a kinder race at least from what we've seen, and they are also still residing on the Saiyan original planet, Planet Sadal. Universe 6's Earth has also succumbed to war, which is why Beerus and Shampa go into the God of Destruction tournament <laughs> to fight over Earth, because Earth apparently has some of the best food. Now, ultimately, Beerus wishes Shampa his Earth back with the Super Dragon Balls, and that's another thing that these two universes have in common, is that they both contain all seven of the Super Dragon Balls. Beerus and Shampa in this very same episode start to fight and Whis and Vado stop them, proclaiming that if two Hakaishin fight, it would be the annihilation of Universe 6 and 7. Now, considering the universes in Dragon Ball are bigger than our own, that would be a multi-universal feat if they were allowed to carry out that fight. And in that very same episode, we learn that those two universes are just two of 12 universes in total. And later we find out that there were originally 18 universes until somebody else destroyed them. These 12 universes, similarly to Universe 6 and 7, all have a God of Creation, a Supreme Kai, a God of Destruction, the Hakaishin, and an Angel Attendant. Eight of these universes are fighting for survival in the Universal Survival arc. Even though we've seen a lot of characters come from some of these universes in the Tournament of Power, we haven't seen a lot about these universes themselves. The universe we've probably seen the most of is Universe 10, where Gawasu and Zamasu are from. We do know that these universes at least don't pertain their own Dragon Balls or even a Zuno, considering that Zamasu had to travel to Universe 7 to obtain those two things. Like I said, we've seen a few contestants from those universes, so it does give you a little insight into what those universes are like, but we need a fuller picture to give a full description of those universes. However, what all these universes do have in common is they have a mortal rating. This is a rating decided by the person that destroyed the other six universes, the Omni King Zeno. This is a measuring system developed to adjudge all the mortals existing in a particular universe. It is directly related to the effectiveness of the jobs of the Supreme Kais and the Gods of Destruction, allowing and promoting the creation and development of adequate civilizations, and also eliminating any inadequate ones. Our particular God of Creation and God of Destruction, Shin and Beerus, don't particularly work that well together. Universe 7 has the second lowest mortal rating, and this is why Universe 7 is fighting in the Tournament of Power along with the other seven universes that have been adjudged to have the lowest mortal rating. The four universes adjudged to have the highest mortal ratings are exempt from this tournament, with the winner of the Tournament of Power gaining exemption from Erasure by Zeno and even now future Zeno. 
So the Omni King Zeno is the ruler of this whole multiverse that consists of 12 macrocosms, formerly 18 macrocosms. In episode 47 of Dragon Ball Super, Whis himself states that Zeno-sama is the most eminent being in all existence. But the most eminent being in all existence doesn't reside in the multiverse that he rules. In fact, the place he resides is on your screen right now. This is in episode 55 of Dragon Ball Super and it's only on your screen for a very short amount of time in that episode. So as you can see there is some sort of giant squid-like creature in the middle of that screen. Well on top of that creature, whatever it is, is Zeno's palace. Now Zeno's palace is enormous but surrounding Zeno's palace are 12 pillars each withholding a universe. So this could mean one of two things. Either the animators are literally just making the universes look smaller to get them in on screen with Goku to just tell us that they are there, but they are actually the size of universes. Or this is dimensional transcendentalism. It isn't the first time we would have seen it in Dragon Ball Super, especially with Zeno. So if you are unaware of dimensional transcendentalism, there is a British show called Doctor Who and the Doctor's spaceship consists of an inside that is a lot bigger than what it appears on the outside. This is a dimensional transcendental spaceship. It appears smaller than what it actually is. However, in episode 55, we find out that it takes even Whis, the fastest being in universe seven, two days to get to Zeno's palace. So whichever way you cook it, the multiverse is far away from Zeno's palace and it's all withheld on that construct that looks like a squid as well as Zeno's palace. The quickest way to get there is to use the Supreme Kai's instant teleportation technique. Goku's very own instant transmission is inadequate to travel this kind of distance. However, Goku has instant transmissioned to and from Beerus's planet and the Supreme World of Kai's, which suggests that the range of instant transmission is multi-universal. Even when in Zeno's palace, the Daishinkan even has to use teleportation to move from one room to the next. And when you get into Zeno's throne room, you'll see that that throne room appears to have planets in the room. Now this is dimensional transcendentalism because those planets look a lot smaller than what they do. And we have even seen Zeno playing chess with future Zeno where he destroys planets, stars and even galaxies. Zeno, who is not even half the size of Goku, is appearing bigger than planets, stars and galaxies. This is dimensionally perverse. So let's go back to that construct that's holding Zeno's palace. If you look in the background, what there appears to be in that background are either some form of stars, galaxies or possibly even other universes in the background. So far the show hasn't really gone in depth about this, so what exactly they are remains to be seen, but it does leave you in wonderment at what avenues this could present in the future for Dragon Ball Super. And as you can see underneath that structure that holds Zeno's palace appears to be that yellow cloudy form that appears underneath Snake Way. So if there are to be other universes or multiverses, as well as Zeno's own universe which he appears to be in, then you could say this is a megaversal structure. So where exactly is the world of Void? A plane described as a world without time or space filled with infinite nothingness. In the world of Void, Jiren and Ultra Instinct Goku have shook this amount of infinite nothingness. But the word infinite is actually misleading in this case because this is not true infinity. What it states is it's a world without time and space. What they are trying to articulate to you is that it's a world that is incalculable nothingness. The fact that the Daishinkan says it will be held in the World of Void suggests that the World of Void is outside of the multiverse, which goes without saying really because the World of Void should grammatically be bigger than the multiverse. And here's why, because the World of Void is a fifth dimensional construct. This is exactly what Beerus is telling us. Thus meaning the world of void can contain anything fourth dimensional on pretty much an infinite level. The Daishinkan states the world is empty. He never states that it is true infinity. It is simply, as Beerus said, a five dimensional construct unbound by space and time. A fifth dimension is the unified field of gravitation and electromagneticism with the concept of it being 
beyond our concept of space and even time. So sure, the world of void is immeasurable, but it's not true infinity. If it was true infinity, that would contain even Zeno's palace and everything around it that we talked about earlier. It's basically its own space. And just like the universes, which are basically orbs of reality, the world of void could be an orb of nothingness, a five-dimensional orb of reality. So Goku and Jiren did not shake true infinity, but their feet were still incredibly impressive. They managed to shake this whole entire space of nothingness. And that alone is at least multiversal in terms of scaling. However, what are more impressive are feats accomplished by the Daishinkan? Not only did he open the gates to the world of void in the first place, but he has managed to manipulate the void by bringing things like matter, time and space, molecules, air, light, energy, all to create the Tournament of Power stage. And whilst we're on the Tournament of Power, we have seen Jiren transcend time. The legendary assassin hit trapped Jiren in a pocket of time, yet Jiren overpowered it just by raw might. And whilst we're on hit, he is also capable of producing multiple pocket dimensions at a time and in even storing time within them. Now, the question is, who created the 5D structure of the World of Void? Who created even the whole Xenoverse, if you can call it that, where the multiverse resides? Was it Zeno or even the Daishinkan? That remains to be seen. In fact, it's one of the things I'm looking forward to most because it's quite clear that Zeno is not an omnipotent. But if Zeno is the creator after all this, that would mean that Zeno is bare minimum a fifth dimensional character, possibly sixth dimensional. However, there is one major contradiction to this, and that is the fact that Zeno seems to be accountable to time, because in the future timeline, there is another Zeno. Whereas the Daishinkan, who existed in the world of Void, and basically put time in the world of Void, was, like I said, able to exist in the world of Void, a place without time and space. So he isn't accountable to time. But Whis, who is the son of the Daishinkan, even stated that Zeno is the most eminent being. So that brings us to the timelines of Dragon Ball, and this is really complicated. So in Dragon Ball Z, we had four alternate timelines, but since then, it's got even more complicated with the Future Trunk Saga in Dragon Ball Super. Originally, in storyline one, we have the main timeline. Timeline one is the main timeline, the timeline that you all know and love, the one that basically leads to the end of Dragon Ball Z and ultimately leads to Dragon Ball Super and Dragon Ball GT as well. Timeline two is where Future Trunks is from as well as Future Zeno, and it's ultimately the one that Future Zeno destroyed at the end of the Future Trunks saga when he eliminated Astral Zamasu as well as the whole multiverse potential megaverse with the erasure technique. Timeline 3 is when Future Trunks returns from the past for the second time, but this time he returns with the blueprints for the androids, and he basically puts a stop to the androids by emergency stop circuit, which he attained from Timeline 4. It's getting wacky, I know. But because of this, he never got strong enough to eventually take on Cell, and Cell overpowered him, killed Future Trunks and used his time machine to go back to find some androids because he wanted to absorb them, creating timelines one and two. Interesting things to note in this timeline, it's possible that Majin Buu was revived by Bobbidi and Deborah with nobody to oppose Majin Buu, but then the Tournament of Power would have been non-existent and the universes with a low mortal rating would have been erased anyway. Timeline 4 is basically exactly the same as Timeline 1. This is also known as the Unseen Timeline. It's the same as Timeline 1 as everything leading up to the Android Saga is the same, but the Z Fighters managed to defeat the Androids because Cell from another timeline never came to interfere. However, in this timeline, Trunks gained the blueprint to the Androids and went back to Timeline 3, which is Cell's timeline, and exterminated the androids by pressing the emergency stop circuit, leading to Cell killing him. In this timeline, there's no such thing as Krillin and Android 18, as she was shut down by the device and destroyed. And Majin Buu probably happened in this timeline as well, but Goku would have been alive this time. Whether he would have been able to stop Majin Buu, well, that would remain to be seen. But since the inception of Dragon Ball Super, there are more timelines. <laughs> 
So obviously I'm referring to the Future Trunk Saga. Now, there are two timelines here, the first one being where Beerus did not destroy Zamasu. Now, Zamasu then goes on to kill Gawasu, steals his time ring and Patara. He then uses the Super Dragon Balls to body snatch Goku's body. Then he, he travels to timeline two to fulfill the Zero Mortals plan. So this timeline came about because gods were involved. It is kind of like a diversion from the Hakai incident between Beerus and Zamasu. And the other new timeline created in the Future Trunks saga is basically where Whis goes to the Future Trunks timeline, that is timeline two, before Zeno erased it all and asked Beerus to deal with Zamasu before he started to rebel. Future Trunks and Mai also went back to that world and there, there are now two Trunks and two Mai's. Now, the largest destructive feat we've seen in Dragon Ball so far is when Future Zeno completely erases the Future Trunks timeline, that is Timeline 2. Basically, he doesn't just erase one universe here, he erases the whole multiverse. In fact, he erases the whole megaverse, as when you can see Goku and Trunks pick Future Zeno up to bring him back to, to the present timeline, Zeno is just floating in some form of void. Now this void isn't similar to the world of void. As you can see, the background is white and the substances in the background are different. So whatever dimension this is, who knows? It could be a sixth dimension for all we know, but it's quite blatantly clear that everything is gone. So if you still have doubts, consider this. Zeno once created a button for Goku called the Zeno button that can translocate Goku to Zeno or vice versa. So it's perfectly reasonable that Zeno can teleport himself. On top of that, the Daishinkan can also teleport or move through portals and so can Zeno's gods. So Zeno is just left there floating about. He doesn't go back to his own mansion. He isn't picked up to go back to his own mansion by the Daishinkan or Zeno's gods. That suggests that he has wiped it all out, the whole megaverse. Zeno had to do it because Astral Zamasu was transcending time and space, even transcending a timeline himself by, by appearing in timeline one. This is because Astral Zamasu was metaphysical and immortal. So this has been a long video. I've covered quite a lot, but basically, all these dimensions, all these timelines, all these universes, the multiverses, the possible megaverse and possibly even more megaverses, all are contained within the Omniverse. So a few weeks ago, a spoiler came out calling the Tournament of Power the Battle of the Omniverse. However, that isn't a true Omniversal battle. Otherwise, we'd see Future Trunks in the tournament as well, representing whatever universe he's in now. There will be different timelines, different dimensions, different multiverses, all fighting. I guess that's an idea for the future. One of the things I think Dragon Ball does extremely well is the lore building around the universes. The lore expansion is incredibly rewarding. And even though it suffers from bad writing, quite frankly, at times, the fact that they can go in so many different directions and avenues concerning stories and places is thrilling. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something. If you did, that's great. If you already know all this, fair enough. I just want to take the time to thank you for taking your time to watch this video. It's a long video and it basically proves that you have a very good attention span. I worked very hard on this video, so please hit that like button, smash the like button with a big bang attack, subscribe if you haven't subscribed already, and remember one very important final message. If you stay calm in any vexing situation, you will never, e -e -e ever become a Super Saiyan. Please make sure you click that subscribe button to make sure you get all my latest content straight to your account as soon as it's released. And here are some more videos from my library, which I'm sure you will all enjoy.